Okay, welcome and thank you for joining us uh, at our electric vehicle charging ordinance workshop. Um, next slide. I want to remind everyone that we are recording this webinar today and we'll be posting it online for your convenience. My name is Suzanne Lucen. I'm the Clean Cities Coalition Coordinator for the San Francisco Department of the Environment. And I'm here with Jenny Kahn, our Clean Cities Coalition intern. And we're here to talk about the city's commercial garage electric vehicle charging ordinance, what it is, why we have it, how to comply, and hopefully why it's a win-win for everyone here. Next slide, please. Before we begin, let's go over a few housekeeping items. Participants are automatically muted on entry to this meeting to prevent background noise. For the Q&A portions of this event, please use the chat to ask your questions. The chat can be opened by clicking on the speech bubble icon on the menu bar. We encourage and appreciate your engagement in the chat. If you experience technical difficulties or connectivity issues, please note that we'll send follow-up email in about a week, and the information presented today will be on the sfenvironment.org website, along with the recording. Also, to keep things simple, we will be presenting today with cameras off. So please add your name and organization when asking a question in the chat. Next slide. So a quick review of the agenda. Again, welcome and thank you all for being here. We'll begin with a review of the ordinance and some overall context on how we got here today. Then Jenny will cover the requirements of the ordinance and review the compliance process followed by a Q&A. After that, we'll have a panel with three EV service providers from FreeWire Tech, Charge Lab, and Sima Connect. Each represents a different business model for installing and managing EV charging, and there will be plenty of time for Q&A. Then we'll have some concluding remarks before we wrap up. Next slide. But before we begin, we have a poll question for you. What is your role? The poll should appear in two locations, both in the chat window and also as a pop-up. Respond in whichever format is more convenient, and don't worry if one or the other does not appear for you. Live results will appear in the chat, but not in the pop-up window. We'll give you about 30 seconds to respond, and then we'll show the results. Another 15 seconds or so for the poll. Well, looks like uh, we have 40% EV service providers, 40% garage operators, and 20% garage owners um, out of our five responses. So thank you for participating. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties now. Let me go ahead and jump in for Suzanne real quick while she figures out her technical issues. Um, so a quick review. The ordinance compliance number um, 24419 was passed by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in October 2019. It applies to commercial garage ordinance and parking lots that are open to the public, charger free for parking and have more than 100 spaces. Those facilities must install level two EV charging at 10% of those parking spaces by January 2023. The ordinance includes a formula to substitute DC fast chargers for level two chargers, which will be discussed in the compliance section. The ordinance requires a good faith effort to analyze the financial and technical feasibility for EV charging at each affected facility and includes a waiver process for facilities where installing EV charging is not feasible at this time. Next. 
A few months after the ordinance was passed, we held a well-attended in-person workshop at the Metro Center in San Francisco. The workshop included much of the information that we'll cover today, and it was followed by an expo that gave attendees an opportunity to talk with EV service providers about their offerings. We had hoped to repeat that workshop and expo last fall, but 2020 had different ideas. This is our second 2021 online workshop, and since we can't host an expo, we will be sending out a packet of information about EV service providers as a follow-up to this workshop. Increasing public EV charging supports the city's climate goals. We have been working toward a goal of net zero emissions by 2050, but in July 2021, during the adoption of our updated climate action plan, Mayor Breed moved that goal to 2040. So because transportation accounts for about 50% of greenhouse gas emissions, we have more to do in less time. Next. The 080100 Roots Climate Action Framework in San Francisco's Call to Action. Zero Waste, 80% Low Carbon Trips, 100% Renewable Energies, Roots for Carbon Emissions to Question. The 80% Low Carbon Trips by 2030 means shifting trips from personal vehicles to walking, biking, public transit. For trips requiring personal vehicles, we want electric vehicles to be easy, accessible, and affordable choice. To support the city's climate action goals, our 2019 EV roadmap established a goal of 100 emission-free trips in, out, and through San Francisco by 2040, with interim goals in 2025 and 2030 shown here. Meeting these goals means we'll have about 170,000 electric cars in San Francisco in 2030, or about 40% of total registrations. And as you know, California's 2020 executive order requires electric vehicles to be 100% of new car registration across the state by 2035. Next. Currently, currently electric cars are about 11% of new car sales in California. Preliminary estimates for national sales indicate that electric cars are about 15% of all car sales and the demand, a huge increase over previous years. There are 70 models available now, with more coming in 2022, including electric pickups and vans. Bloomberg New Energy Finance projects that in 2024, the purchase of price of an electric eagle vehicle will be equal to that of a similar internal combustion vehicle. And we know the electric cars cost about a third to maintain and operate compared to glass vehicles. Generally, electric car drivers pay about a dollar per, ga per ga gallon equivalent for fuel. Next. And um, Suzanne, if you're available, would you like to? Yes. Continue? Apologies okay. about that. Of course, the only time my computer has frozen is when we're recording a webinar. Um, and Jenny, thank you so much for, um, for stepping back in. Um, OK, so what does this mean in terms of expanding EV charging? To understand that, we estimated the demand for publicly accessible EV charging in 2030. The analysis was conducted by the International Council on Clean Transportation, or ICCT, which is an independent nonprofit organization known for high quality research and for discovering the Volkswagen diesel scandals. So they're very good with this data. Um, ICCT quantified the number, type, and distribution of charging stations needed to support rapid EV uptake, which is shown on this map. The zip codes in the darker green will have higher electric vehicle stocks and vice versa. The demand for public level two and fast chargers are shown respectively by the orange and blue numbers, which are shown in circles whose size indicates the relative demand for public chargers in each zip code. The take home message is that even with a major reduction in personal automobile trips, we need EV charging in the city to expand by 18% per year to keep up with demand. Currently, we have about a thousand chargers, publicly accessible chargers in San Francisco, and we'll need 4,000 by 2030. Next slide. 
And with San Francisco's real estate constraints of limited supply and high costs, one way to meet charging demand is to electrify as many existing parking spaces as possible. The city is working to expand charging infrastructure in our publicly owned garages and lots. The, San Fran the Port of San Francisco is expanding public charging on its properties, and the Commercial Garage Ordinance brings privately owned parking garages and lots into the solution by requiring a good faith effort to evaluate the potential for EV charging in their facilities and install charging where feasible. So now I'll hand it back over to Jenny to talk about ordinance requirements and compliance steps. Thanks, Suzanne. The commercial garage ordinance requires public commercial garages and lots with more than 100 parking spaces to install EV charging stations at 10% of spaces by January 1st, 2023. There are two ways to comply. The first is to install level two charging stations defined as stations with less than 40 kilowatt at 10% of parking spaces. The maximum required number of level two chargers is 200. For example, if your garage has 2,500 spaces, you'll be required to install 200 level, char level two chargers instead of 250. The second way to comply is to install direct current, also known as DC fast charging station that provide a similar volume of charging. DC fast chargers are more powerful, so less chargers are needed to supply a similar volume of charging. A minimum of two DC fast chargers are required with an additional charger required for every additional 250 spaces over 750. For example, a garage with 1,500 spaces would be required to install five DC fast chargers. The maximum number of DC fast chargers required would be eight for any project. Next. In the event that your site cannot comply with the ordinance, there is a waiver process. Operators can request a full or partial waiver based on a variety of factors. We take into account insufficient existing electrical capacity, site conditions, which technically prevent installation and require documentation of good faith efforts with at least two service providers to qualify for a waiver. Next. The ordinance is connected with the permitting process and starting January 1st, 2022, ordinance compliance or waiver completion will be conditions of the commercial parking facility permit issued by SFPD. Lack of good faith effort in compliance will result in fines or suspensions or revocation of your permit. We don't want you to be impacted by any of these enforcement mechanisms and we're here to help support you through the process. Next. Since the ordinance will soon impact the permit renewal process, I want to provide a brief overview of it. Six to eight weeks before your permit expires, you should contact SFPD to begin the process. SFPD will send you a permit packet, which will include the permit application, checklist, site security plan form, and the ordinance fact sheet. Next, you'll need to complete ordinance requirements, which will be either the compliance form, form A, or the waiver form, form B. After completing the rest of the permit application, you can schedule a meeting with SFPD to submit your application. A completed ordinance form will be a required part of your permit renewal packet starting January 1st, 2022. We don't want your permit process to be delayed, so please don't hesitate to reach out before this key date if you have any questions. Next. The main goal of this workshop is to provide you with all the information you need to get started with the ordinance process. The process starts by contacting an electric vehicle service provider, also known as an EVSP, to arrange a consultation and feasibility study. Whether you think your site can or cannot comply, contacting an EVSP is an important first step to begin the process. Next, you can work with one or more EVSPs to find out which financing, installation, maintenance, and ownership models are available and determine which one works best for your site. Once you've determined your plan, you need to complete the appropriate form, Form A, the compliance form, or Form B, the waiver form. Finally, you need to submit your permit application, your selected ordinance form, and backup documents to SFPD. Next. Before I present on more details about the forms, we want to gain a better understanding of your site's status. Please fill out the poll that displays on your screen and answer the question, what stage of the process is your site in? We'll give everyone about 30 seconds to respond, and as a reminder, poll results are updated and visible in the chat box. So we'll give everyone 30 seconds. Okay. 
we have about 15 seconds remaining. All right, I see there are six responses and we'll go ahead and close the poll now. Um, it looks like 33% are in progress or have at least contacted one EVSP. Uh, 40, 14% have not started and need to contact the EVSP and 42% are not associated with the garage. All right, I do see a question and we will address it during the Q&A section. Uh, next slide, please. In this next section, I will provide more details on the compliance and waiver forms and the information that will be required for, com for completion. Note that for all forms, you'll be required to provide information on the garage address and applicant contact information so we can follow up with the right person if we need more information to approve the form. Let's start with form A, the compliance form. In it, we will require information of the charging station provider Date the stations will be open to the public and equipment schedule and site plan for the stations. We'll also need the total number of parking spaces, type and number of charging stations, the power output and number of connectors per station. Next. Form B is the full or partial waiver request form. You'll need to select one or more justifications that applies to your site. There are three available waiver reasons and they each have a specific duration. Utility infrastructure is unable to supply sufficient electrical capacity will result in a five year waiver. Site conditions make it technically infeasible to install the infrastructure will also result in a five year waiver. Site conditions make compliance financially infeasible will result in a two year waiver. Note, we'll go through each of these sections in more detail. Next. Let's start with the first reason. The existing local utility infrastructure is unable to supply sufficient electrical capacity. For example, some sites may not have the infrastructure available to upgrade their site with charging. This reason is eligible for a full or partial waiver request. If this reason is selected, we'll require information on existing and required service amperage, estimated cost for upgrade, license contractor name and license number, and the supporting report or analysis. One key thing that is required for all waivers is supporting documentation outlining the site's finding from a professional. Next. Second reason, existing site conditions make it technically infeasible to install infrastructure. For example, a site may not be able to meet the ADA requirements for the charging installation. This reason is eligible for a full or partial waiver request. If this reason is selected, we'll require information on existing site condition, name of company that conducted the site analysis, company contact info and the supporting report or analysis. Next. Finally, the third reason, garage operator has made good faith efforts to enter into an agreement with at least two EVSPs at minimal or no cost to operator, but the companies declined because the agreement was not financially viable. For some site, the math may not pencil out, so this waiver is available. One key requirement is that site must work with at least two EVSPs to get their site assessed. This reason is eligible for full waiver request only. If this reason is selected, we'll require information on both EVSP companies that provided the assessments and the associated report, supporting report or analysis. Next. Sites are eligible to apply for a partial waiver if they can install some chargers but are unable to meet full compliance due to insufficient electrical capacity or technical infeas infeasibility. To apply for a partial waiver, you must include information on the number of level two or fast charging stations to meet full requirement, the number of level two or fast charging stations proposed for partial waiver. You also need to provide the approximate date the stations will be available to the public, the report or analysis to support and request and the equipment schedule and site plan for the stations you plan to have installed. And that completes the overview of the forms. Next. For next steps, you can always go to sfenvironment.org to check out the latest information on the ordinance. The web page features the ordinance text, fact sheets, as well as the forms once they become available online. Some key dates to keep in mind. Starting January 1st, 2022, ordinance forms will be required for annual permit renewal. 
don't wait until then to get your questions answered. You can also you can always contact us as soon as you have any questions so your permit process won't be delayed. The ordinance forms I just reviewed will be available online by March 2022. However, if your site is ready to complete the forms before then, please contact us directly at chargingmadeeasy at sfgov.org and we can send you a PDF to fill out. We'll also notify all workshop attendees once the forms are available online. Finally, the ordinance compliance date is January 1st, 2023. That may seem like a long time from now, but it's crucial that you start work now so you're not at risk at incurring any fines. Next. And let's open it up for um, questions on compliance. We have about eight minute, minutes available to take your questions. Please use the chat box to enter your questions and keep in mind we'll be covering the EV service provider resources next and we'll have another opportunity for questions later. Great, and it looks like we have one question in the chat so far. And first off, apologies to folks that are having issues submitting, um, responding to the polls. That's how I got kicked out of the, the webinar initially. So we're working on that. Um, the one question we have in here um, is, you mentioned garages that charge a fee and are open to the public have to comply. What if it is a closed garage that charges a fee but is strictly only available to building occupants? Does the garage still need to follow the ordinance? And according to the city attorney's office, if your commercial facility requires an operating permit from the San Francisco Police Department, then your facility is subject to ordinance number 24419, which we're discussing today. And we have another question. Can you share how much the fine is? There's a fine, there's a schedule in the um, in the ordinance text itself. We don't have it handy today, um, but we can send that out um, with the follow-up information. Um, but again, our goal is to make sure that no one is subject to fines, that we work with everyone because the point is here is to um, is to determine whether your facility can support EV charging. Um, and to walk through that process rather than, um, we don't want anybody to have fines. And we have another question. Do stacked or valet parking spaces count toward the 100 parking spaces? I won't speculate on that, but we will we will um, get an answer to that and and include that in the response to, um, in the responses that we're gonna send out. And the next question is, where can garage and parking lot owners go to get quotes for EV charging stations? Is there a pr an approved vendor list? Is there a list of local distribu distributors where these chargers can be purchased? We will send, so we would have loved to have had an expo where you can actually talk to um, EV service providers live. But since we don't have that, we do have a packet of information that we will send out after the webinar that I think has, has information from about 20 EV service providers that are operating in the Bay Area. We'll also send you some links and we'll show those later to um, websites in California that also have, have more listings of EV service providers um, that are operating in California. And so you can look at their summaries um, of their business models and figure out which ones might be best for your um, operation and reach out to them that way. And then again, we'll have three service providers today that'll talk about their business, their different business models um, later on in the, in the webinar. Do we have any other questions? Um, if not, then we can, um, here we go. Can you please give an overview of the waiver types again? Once it becomes infeasible, how should folks go about applying for the waiver? So I could kind of go over the um, waiver process again. Um, when you get the order, when you get to the ordinance form, there will be um, two forms. So form A, which is stating that you are complying and you are you're in full compliance. You have all the chargers um, that your um, garage um, is be is required. 
form B will be the waiver form, which, and there are, um, you could either say that you're requ um, requesting a full waiver, which means you are not able to get any of the charging stations by um, January 1st, 2023. There's also the partial waiver, um, which means you are able to get some charging stations that your lot or garage requires, but you aren't able to get all of the ones that you need. And then in the forms, there's different reasons, whether if it's your utility infrastructure is unable to supply sufficient electrical capacity, um, your site conditions make it technically infeasible to install the infrastructure, or your site conditions doesn't isn't um, financially feasible to install these chargers. And then um, these waivers or these uh, waivers do last certain um, years. So if it's um, utility infrastructure is not able to supply the electrical capacity or your site condition is technically infeasible, those last five years. If your site condition is financially infeasible, then those are only two years. And we've set that two year um, limit for financial infeasibility because we know that technology changes and that the, the math could change in two years and, and make your site more appropriate for EV charging. So do we have any other questions? Not trying to rush us, but I don't want to have dead time. Okay, uh, what types of documentation are needed for the waiver applications? A report from the provider saying it's financially infeasible. Yes, we would ask you to provide documentation from two different EV service providers um, outlining um, the feasibility of your site. Um, and that's because there are different business models and one approach may um, have different numbers and another approach may be more appropriate for your facility. So that's why we ask you to, to, um, to contact two EV service providers. Last call for questions online. Um, after that, we can um, we can also answer questions after the fact if you it, by, via email, and we'll provide responses here as well. Um, right, I'm still working with PG&E to get more power brought to our site. If we apply for a waiver, do you just need documentation from PG&E? The waiver system is written that we, we want documentation from EV service providers, but let's follow up um, after, um, after the webinar and make sure that we give you an appropriate answer for that. Okay, how about we go to the next slide? Great, so thank you everyone for your patience today. In a few minutes, we'll have a panel of speakers representing three EV charging service providers who will talk about their approach to supplying EV charging. Next, please. But first, some context. We require operators to contact at least two EV service providers, EV charging service providers, because they each provide different services and fee structures to meet your business needs. Some own and operate the equipment, some install equipment for the owner to manage, and most have strategies to maximize your facility's electrical infrastructure. We are agnostic about EV service providers and we don't make specific recommendations, but as mentioned, we will send a follow-up packet with information from EVSPs operating in the Bay Area. You can also find information about EVSPs on the Cal EVIB Connects website and the Go Electric Drive website. Next, please. Financing incentives are available for EV charging. The Bay Area Air Quality Management District's charge program is scheduled to open in late 2021 or early 2022. The charge program provides incentives to reduce the cost of publicly accessible charging stations. 
The charge program is open every year or two, but it can't be used with legislative mandates. So once we get to January 2023, when the commercial garage ordinance is in effect, charge funds will not be available for these projects. It makes sense to not incentivize something that's been mandated um, by law. So another funding source is the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard or LCFS, which incentivizes low carbon alternatives to petroleum fuel. LCFS isn't quite a retail program because it requires specific brokering of credits, but EVSPs are well equipped to navigate this process with you. Next slide, please. So now we'll have about 30 minutes for our EVSP panel. Today we're joined by Mike Glasky from Charge Lab, Patrick Flahive from Freewire, and Anthony DeVito from SEMA Connect. So from left to right on the screen, please introduce yourself and briefly describe your business model and approach for providing charging services from the, cons from the customer perspective. Take it away, Mike. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, so yeah, I'm Mike Glasky from Charge Lab. Uh, first and foremost, we are a EV charging management platform. Uh, so we put in place a platform to allow you to install pretty much any hardware you could want into your garage and manage those chargers, uh, control them remotely, understand how much electricity you're using and whether or not you want to uh, charge drivers to actually use those uh, units there in your garage. Uh, we work with our customers to help them understand what units are going to work best at their location. That is part of why we're hardware agnostic. We also want to make it easy to expand your network as more EV drivers start parking in your garages. Um, we have full insight into revenue and usage, full control over pricing and scheduling, depending on what's going to work for you. We could even subgroup it out so that if you want to bill users or if you want to allow this uh, for employees as an amenity and have them have free charging, we can do that for you as well, um, all on the same system. Uh, one of the biggest things that we've seen as a benefit for our California customers, of course, is the LCFS uh, credit tracking and monetization. Uh, we are partnered with a brokerage that handles the entire process for our California customers, uh, making it really easy to have an additional source of revenue and offset a lot of the costs that come along with installing and maintaining these EV charging networks. And that's about it. So Suzanne, I'll pass it back to you. All Thank right. You. There we go. All right, hello everybody, I'm Patrick Flayive. Um, <clears throat> I am, uh, I've been at FreeWire for about two years. Uh, I'm one of the sales managers here. And I'm actually sitting uh, in our Oakland office uh, and I'm a San Francisco resident as well. Uh, so definitely a, a local representative that can come out and uh, do site walks. Uh, and then a quick background on our company. We've been around since 2014. Uh, and we really got our start doing uh, workplace charging uh, there in Silicon Valley at the likes of Netflix and Microsoft. And now we're really focusing on the picture that you see there, uh, which is our battery integrated DC fast charger. And from a business model perspective, we do both uh, working with site hosts that want to own uh, and operate charging, collect the charging revenue uh, and the LCFS credits that go along with that. And then we also do offer uh, charging as a service where we can pretty much offer uh, full turnkey uh, charging deployments. So very open to both of those conversations. Uh, and then to kind of get into it, uh, why is Boost Charger uh, a good fit in San Francisco? <clears throat> um, first, it's a battery integrated DC fast charger that has the same uh, input power uh, as a level two charger, which is either two, 208 or 240. So from a lot of the, the space constraint sites that you might have in San Francisco, we're avoiding that 480 volt power uh, upgrade that PG&E is going to quote 12 to 24 months to, to put out there. And then also that's going to take a, a uh, potentially uh, five parking spots uh, with the infrastructure that's needed for that. And then also another reason it's a good fit is this product has uh, simultaneous charging at 75 kilowatts or can charge one electric vehicle at 150 kilowatts, which means that uh, it counts as two DC or two chargers 
uh, for two DC fast chargers for this program. So it satisfies uh, the mandate with uh, the DC fast charging. And then the big thing, and uh, like really when you're thinking about owning and operating or, or putting EV charging at your site, really you need to understand what your, uh, your utility bill is gonna look like and what your energy rates are. And we have 160 kilowatt hours of battery storage in the bottom half of this unit that really lowers your operating costs and reduces your demand charges. So in San Francisco, where you've got some of the highest rates or highest energy rates in the country, it's really important to understand that. Uh, and that's something that we can walk you through uh, looking at your utility bill and what to expect from uh, if you went with a traditional DC fast charger or if you went with uh, a battery integrated charger like what we have to offer. Uh, so very happy to kind of walk you through. Uh, but if there's one thing I guess you leave this with today, it's really understanding your utility bill and the impacts of offering um, DC fast charging or even level two charging to your energy bill. Uh, so I will uh, pass it on to uh, the next person. Hey everybody, how you doing? Thank you so much for letting us all have an opportunity to chat. I'm Anthony DeVito, uh, Territory Sales Manager for Northern California, essentially LA up. Uh, Sema Connect's business model, while we do offer level three charging, we focus on level two charging. So there's two types of speeds in level two charging. There's a 30 amp draw, which will get you about 25 miles for every hour that your vehicle is plugged in. There's an 80 amp draw, which will get you about 70 miles for every hour that you're plugged in. There's some math there that we can talk online. I think the thing that most excites uh, me about Sema Connect is we are an original equipment manufacturer. We make what we sell. There is no middleman. You guys are going, when you contact me, you're going to be working factory direct. There is in our industry something called open protocol, open charge point protocol. And what that means is that you're not stuck with one manufacturer, one software package, one software provider. And what's really important, you know, we all know it is open source, but the thing that's most important about open protocol is you have your company that is driving customer success, that is getting you the most competitive rates. The things about Sema Connect, we do have state-of-the-art hardware. If it's everything that is in the industry is what our specialty on level two. 4G LTE cloud-based software. So we've got the hardware, we've got the software, we have turnkey customized solutions. If you have a facilities property or a facilities manager or an electrician, we will train them. If you would like us to recommend an installation crew that is local, clearly we can do that also. We work with you on the rebates, we work with you on the grants, we work with you on the tax credits. Uh, me personally, just my background in 30 seconds is that I was a journeyman electrical engineer for the U.S. Army in the 90s. After grad school, I worked for the Las Vegas, Nevada Electric Company as a financial analyst. Came, I moved to San Diego in 2002 and got into solar panels and did that until 2015 in Los Angeles. Since 2015, I've been full time in electric vehicle car charging and contractor finance. So for me, when you think about Sema Connect, I guess the thing I'd like you to take away from this is hardware, software, management services. So when you think hardware, when you think software, when you think management, you want the ability to control the price, whether or not you want some users to be free or some users to pay a certain amount per kilowatt hour or per hour. When you think about access, the ability to control who uses the charging stations and when, whether it be staff or visitors or somebody like me driving up in my Tesla, when you think about load management, there are options like CAAS, charging as a service, low carbon fuel standard that's been mentioned a couple of times, whether it be Cal, EVIP, or whether it be a local municipality or utility rebate, we can work with you on all of that. And you can take a screenshot. There's all my contact information in the bottom left hand corner. And, you know, I just think from Sema Connect, when we say fast, easy, reliable, and affordable, it's our mandate. It's what we work live by. That's it for now. Great. Thank you all. Um, thank you all so much. So we have um, a couple of questions that we've queued up um, and then please use the chat to submit additional questions. So our first question is, what is your approach to providing charging services from the customer perspective? Where do you start? What information should the customer or the site host have available to begin the conversation? 
Um, we have about a minute each or so to answer the questions and we'll start with Mike. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, the first thing that we always want to understand is how is the garage set up? Um, what sort of power is available? Our system does allow for power management. So we can often get in more chargers than you would initially expect um, onto a panel in a garage uh, to allow for more users to have EV charging access. Um, so we really want to understand what's the power available? What's the use case? And how many users do you think you're going to have on a regular basis? Then we're going to help the site host monitor that usage over time uh, to really understand how they can best monetize it um, and whether or not they need to expand their network. So it all comes down to helping the site host, helping the garage owner really uh, make the most out of installing EV chargers. We don't want to put ports in where it doesn't make sense. Uh, so we always want to do a deep dive with them when it comes to that. Great, yeah. thank you. Um, Patrick? Yeah, um, and completely agree with everything Mike said. Really gets down to the, the site level. And I guess from like a free wire perspective, uh, we're kind of looking at two things. First, as a site owner or a site host, I should say, really understand the project economics. Uh, what's it going to cost you? Uh, and how do I ultimately make money on this? What's the ROI going to look like? Uh, and then uh, kind of like what Mike was saying too, doing a site walk uh, and then trying to see where the power is. Can we use the existing capacity that's at the site? Uh, how far do we have to run the conduit from the power to where you want to put DC fast charging? Is there uh, flexibility on where you can put charging at the site? So it's really kind of both um, kind of understanding the, the, the economics of it, uh, looking at your utility bill, and then ultimately getting down to a site level um, and understanding where we can put this uh, and do we have different options uh, in doing so. Uh, and then ultimately when you do that site walk as well, you can get a better understanding of what that uh, installation cost is gonna be uh, as well, which is obviously very important um, to the project economics. Pass it over to you, Anthony. Oh, thanks, Patrick. So uh, when I look at projects, the first thing I'm usually asking is what is the electrical capacity in the electrical closet? Uh, we look at amps specifically, the speed of electricity per parking spot. Can the electrical closet support an additional 40 amps per parking spot or 100 amps per parking spot? And level two car charging, a 40 amp double pull breaker is typically a 7.2 kW charging station. A 100 amp double pull breaker is typically a 19.2 kW charging station. So it's always about amps, what's available electrically. And then the second thing is where are the spot's gonna be located. Is this an open air parking lot or is this a parking garage? So that's one of the things we always wanna consider and I think you guys should know in advance. And then lastly, where are these charging stations going to be located specifically to the quantity of available parking spaces. It was mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. I always recommend somewhere right now today between five to 10% of your existing parking spaces. So if you had 100 spaces, I would be telling you, you should be putting in somewhere between eight to 12 parking spaces for level two car charging. Obviously DCFC level three charging is a different scenario, but these are the questions you wanna start asking yourself. Thank you. Great, great. Um, okay, so our next question, how are your charging installations typically financed? What rebates or incentives are available to minimize upfront costs for site hosts in San Francisco? And this time we'll start with Patrick. All right, um, so I guess uh, for um, uh, the, the first thing that we look at is um, do you have a tax liability? Right now there's a 30% um, federal tax credit up to $30,000 uh, and there's talks that that could go up to $100,000 and also it becoming a rebate. Uh, so that's obviously going to be a huge game changer if it does go up to that um, from the project economic standpoint. And then there's different funding opportunities from CARB, uh, BA, QMD, uh, and then also the CEC. And then a huge thing too that we can, uh, that you should uh, try and understand is the LCFS credits, which are low carbon fuel standard credits. And those can be uh, very lucrative uh, if you are owning and operating the charger, you can collect those. Uh, so that's something uh, we can walk you through to, to show you what those LCFS credits can be worth 
uh, and then run different scenarios based on uh, the utilization of the chargers as well. Uh, so those are some of the main ones um, that we uh, kind of cover. Great. Anthony, you want to go next? Yeah, great. So as Patrick just mentioned, the tax credits, 30 percent with the financial caps, it's about tax appetite. If you are a nonprofit, if you have low tax appetite, then the tax credit is something you definitely want to talk to whoever is crunching your numbers about maybe doing a special purpose entity. Of course, there's California EVIP, Cal EVIP. And, you know, there's if there's a capital constraint, there's charging as a service where you can uh, instead of buying the charging stations up front, you could pay a monthly fee. I don't know that it's and my recommendation as a first pass, but we could talk about it offline if you wanted to email me. The thing I want to leave you with is uh, while as a manufacturer, we do not directly finance, we don't run credit checks and finance you directly. What Patrick said, the low carbon fuel standard is a very important thing. Low carbon fuel standard if you're not in a residential or multi-unit dwelling, because the way the legislation is written, the utility, PG&E specifically, the utility gets the low carbon fuel standard if it's a residential site. But if you are in a commercial garage, if you're in a commercial site, then the low carbon fuel standard, LCFS, the carbon credits, on average, it's going to cover about 80% of your operating costs. So if you have a $1,000 a month electric bill and you hired a broker instead of doing it yourself, you are going to probably get about $800 of the $1,000 electric bill in quarterly payments. So the low carbon fuel standard is a carbon credit. It's paid out quarterly, and it's going to cover a big piece of the electricity. So when you think about operating overhead, and if you're in a commercial site, that LCFS, the low carbon fuel standard, is a very important thing to be considering. Thank you. Great. And Mike? Yeah, so I don't think there's too much I could uh, say that Patrick and Anthony haven't already covered um, in terms of California and San Francisco incentives. Um, we do something very similar uh, to SEMA Connect where we do have charging as a service as well to help reduce the CapEx expense um, and operationalize a lot of that cost. Um, but the big one for most of our California customers is the LCFS credits because we have partnered with a brokerage uh, to handle all the tracking, all the paperwork, all the exchange. And we go ahead and work out a deal with our clients to help cover that cost for them. Um, it has allowed them to gain additional revenue to help offset the cost of installing chargers or leasing chargers and that extra electricity. Um, so we do work with all of our clients to make sure that they do have a good ROI on this through a variety of avenues. Great. That was a great range of answers and explanations around LCFS. Super, super helpful. Thank you. Um, all right. So our last um, setup question, um, and we'll start with Anthony this time, is what else would you want a customer or a side horse to know in advance of an installation? Do you have any tips or suggestions for our audience today? So go ahead. Sure. Anthony. Sure. The term is future proofing. So beyond location, as we talked about amperage, beyond budgeting, uh, what is your capital expense? What is your operating expense for these charging stations beyond your financing considerations? You need to think about growth. And you can quote me as a subject matter expert. I've been doing this since 2015. Anthony DeVito said X, and here's what I'm saying. By the year 2028, I predict one in four cars is going to be all electric vehicle. Could be 2026. And electric vehicles are coming. I have homeowner associations all the time who are asking me, well, why do we want to do it? Only a couple of people have electric cars. I'm like, your visitors want destination charging. Destination charging is when you're at a site for more than two or three hours. I just want to implore all of you to not think about your car charging needs now, but think about what they're going to be in three to five years. And I will leave you with this. The key thing you want to understand is, do you have the electrical capacity and amperage do you have conduit? If you're going to be opening up a concrete or an asphalt trench, put in extra conduit now so that even though you're only putting in six stations or 10 stations, whatever you're putting in, 
put in enough conduit that's going to allow you to grow. It'll let you upsize later on. Think of it like the Lego blocks that children play with. Put the foundation, that green mat down now, and you can build the blocks as you want to get into it. So it's about amperage. It's about conduit. As you install this first round of charging stations, leave yourself that capacity to grow. Future-proof your sites. Thank you. Anthony, that was great. There, I we have definitely worked with um, with facilities where they just one person put in a little extra conduit um, during a, another construction project, and it completely reduced their their cost for installing EV charging. And it's great advice to be future proofed. Um, Mike, yeah, um, Anthony did. Uh, he he beat me to that one. Um, <laughs> that's usually what I tell people as well. Um, just like we're seeing with the San Francisco ordinance, um, those ordinances are going to increase in the future. It's going to go from 10% to 20%. It's going to happen everywhere eventually. Um, so whether or not more people are driving EVs, you're going to have to install more chargers. So we do want to make sure that you're set up for the future. Um, and that's part of our model as well with the being hardware agnostic. We want you to have the best charger regardless of when you're installing them and when you're expanding your network. The other thing I think it's important to know is to really understand too um, just what the costs are going to be for you um, in terms of either upgrading your service in your garage, installing the chargers, paying for the chargers, and we want to help you understand that. Um, so when we do have conversations, we like to really dive into what is your electricity usage been like, um, what is your uh, budget look like, and what are your plans for the future? And not just this year, but next year, five years down the line, 10 years down the line, so that we could really model something out that's going to make financial sense for you. All right. Great points, Mike and Anthony. Definitely agree on the on the future proofing. Uh, and I guess the, the first thing, uh, understand your utility bill, specifically what your demand charges are, and we can start modeling out what your what your operating costs are going to be. Uh, and then especially with uh, the supply chain shortages, uh, the uh, utilities quoting or and what they're saying is going to be the time to uh, to bring in new infrastructure, start the project sooner and later, uh, because these really are depending on <clears throat> how much power or how much you're relying on PG&E, these projects can take, um, they can take as long as 12 months or all the way to 24 months. So definitely start sooner than later. And then also what's the impact of adding EV charging to your parking lot? Is there ADA compliance issues? How many parking spaces do you lose, uh, if any? Um, and then ultimately, what makes sense for your lot? DC fast charging or level two? So definitely encourage you to talk with uh, with multiple vendors on both the level two and DC fast charge to see uh, what both of those options look like. And so you can come up to the best conclusion for your site. Uh, so that's kind of the, the things that I, uh, we'd say that you should cover. Great, and so those are our queued up questions, and I'm wondering if there are any other questions for our EV service providers from those are, that are attending the workshop. Um, looking for the chat, looking at the chat, and uh, um, looking for additional questions. So we'll give a couple of minutes, and also say that um, you're welcome to follow up with us or with any of our guests today with additional questions and their contact info will be included in the EV service provider packet that we will send up as a follow up to the workshop today. Okay, hearing none. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Do Tesla chargers count toward the 10% required? We are agnostic um, around chargers. There, there was nothing in the ordinance that was written um, specifically that would exclude Tesla chargers. And I guess one thing to chime in too, one difficulty you have if you do add only Tesla chargers is you might limit yourself to only being able to charge just those Tesla vehicles. So depending on uh, what your what your parking lot consists of, that may make some some tenants or or people 
not as happy if you only are offering that that Tesla charger. So Tesla chargers have a different connector than the standard in the industry, which is J1772. And so it's not that Tesla chargers do or do not uh, fulfill the 10% standard. But what's great is when you get a Tesla these days, it comes with the J1772 adapter. Yeah, I, I have to agree with both Patrick and Anthony. I mean, Teslas can use pretty much any charger out there as long as they have that adapter, but only Teslas can use Tesla chargers. So it is a good question on whether or not Teslas would count towards the 10% if it's excluding non-Tesla drivers. And we'll confirm that. Um, and I will, Great I answer. will go back to, yeah, I will go back to, um, we know that, you know, in the first wave of EV adoption, that Teslas were a, a huge component of that. Um, but again, we know that um, the purchase price for, for electric vehicles across the board is coming down and we're looking at price parity in a couple of years. And so um, future proofing might include making sure that that all cars can charge at um, at your site. Um, and again, so we have another question about regarding stacked valet park spaces and parking garages. If a garage has 88 spaces but can fit 130 cars, would that garage need to comply with the ordinance? There's compliance, um, but let us make sure that we have the right answer to this question um, rather than answering it here. I want to make sure that um, we understand some of the background of the um, the rules that the police department follow for um, for the permits for garages that are separate from how our ordinance is written that we're speaking of today. Do we have more questions? Thought I'd jump in with one more thought, if that's all right, Susan. Go for it. I kind of just, you know, I'm dating myself here, but when I was a kid, nobody thought that Japanese automotors would have the impact that they did. Uh, nobody saw it coming. Uh, I like to think a lot of people saw it coming and just didn't talk about it. But there was just this surprise, like, wow, these amazing high quality vehicles that were gasoline sippers instead of gasoline guzzlers. It changed the automotive industry forever. And we're watching this happen again in our lifetime. EVs are coming. They're coming from Europe. They're coming from Asia. Uh, it's not just Tesla, but there are trillions of dollars going into manufacturing facilities. These automotive manufacturing facilities are going to be rolling out millions upon millions of vehicles per year so when you say that we sold four million in 2021 we're talking about 40 million by 2026 2028 40 million vehicles being sold i mean they're coming guys and you need to have the infrastructure in your facilities now as a, and anybody who is listening to me talk it's all about future proofing thank you i really appreciate everybody's time Yeah, and those are all great points, definitely. Um, well, I'm not seeing any um, any other questions in the chat, but um, I wanted to also give the opportunity to our EV service providers. If you had any any last comments before we close out this part of the of the workshop, I did mine. I'll leave it to the other, Patrick and Mike. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Patrick, you can take it. Uh, no last thoughts. Really thanks uh, for having us on and we're local. So if anybody uh, is looking for a site walk, um, happy to, to ride my bike uh, or drive my AV over to uh, to come check out your site to see if L2 or, or DC fast charger might make sense for you. Great. You all have been awesome. This has been a great panel with a lot of amazing information and we really appreciate your time and participation today. Um, and again, for the audience here, all the information for our um, for our guests today will be included in the follow-up packet, um, as well as other options um, for you to look at. So I think with that, we can go to the next slide.
where we have a poll and I'm not gonna touch my computer this time. Um, so this is our final poll. Um, and uh, the question is, are there any areas where you still have questions? Um, and that's to give us a little feedback and to make sure that we, um, that we round out everything as, uh, with this webinar. Well, and again, we'll give you about 30 seconds. Oh, and I should remind that um, you can respond in the chat versus on the form for the poll. We'll give you another 10 seconds or so for responses. Okay, so it looks like we do have some um, follow-up questions on the compliance process, um, had three responses there, the waiver process, two responses there, contacting an EV service provider, two responses there, and 33% don't have any additional questions, so that's good. Um, but again, you can follow up with us after, after the webinar with specific questions, um, and we're happy to help. Again, we're, we want to make this an easy process for you and we want to avoid any, any complications or, or potential fines. So with that, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, so again, um, many thanks to our EV service providers for your time and participation today. And to wrap up, Again, we remind, we recommend that you get started early. There can be long lead times in designing, permitting, and installing charging infrastructure. And we heard a little bit today about utility delays. And again, we re recommend that you contact your utility early in the process. So um, next slide. So in closing, um, we hope this workshop provided the information you need to at least get started. Um, the purpose of the ordinance, again, is to increase the availability of public EV charging in San Francisco, not to levy fines or create paperwork. We're really trying to level the playing field for everyone. Contacting and talking to EV service providers is your first step, and hopefully you'll be on your way to compliance. So again, if you have questions or obstacles, please reach out to us via chargingmadeeasy at sfgov.org sfgov.org, where do I work, um, with, future, with further questions. We're definitely here to help. So next slide. And with that, on behalf of the San Francisco Environment Team and the San Francisco Clean Cities Coalition and my colleagues, uh, Nicole and Jenny, thank you again for attending today. We appreciate your time. We will host a final workshop in January to help make compliance easy. And again, we'll be sending you a follow-up packet with information from the workshop. And thanks so much and have a great rest of your day.